Okay, we are live. Teji, good afternoon and welcome to um, another seminar of uh, the course on globalization, uh, which is for ITU students, but we welcome all other participants and people who are watching uh, us through the internet. Uh, today, we are very um, honored and glad that we have an excellent uh, speaker with us today. Uh, Professor Dr. Nadeem al Haq is currently the Vice Chancellor of uh, the Pakistan Institute for Development Economics in, in Islamabad. Uh, but he has done, um, uh, he has uh, uh, spent a lifetime working with the IMF. Uh, he has authored some very critical and um, uh, cutting edge uh, papers on economics. Um, and uh, most of all, I think uh, he is a very good good thinker because I think that's some something that you know we have uh, largely kind of lost in in Pakistan. So he's kind of leading the the charge in uh, recreating um, a very thinking environment in Pakistan and the transformation that fight has had uh, in the few months that he's been vice chancellor has been exceptional. Um, and uh, we are very glad, uh, but we are also very jealous of all the work he is actually doing there because we can sort of try and emulate. And I should say, you know, as I was saying earlier, that uh, all these online le lectures and everything uh, through Zoom and all that was pioneered by PAIT in Pakistan as soon as the lockdown began and other universities have fallen suit there. So Dr. Nadeem al is here with us talking about the economics of globalization. Uh, I'll perhaps sort of posit a couple of questions to him and then he can sort of uh, talk about it. Uh, so Dr. Nadeem al uh, you know, of course your uh, uh, focus is wide, wide ranging. So hence we will we'll kind of begin with um, uh, your assessment. So uh, our students have, have read some, some readings on it, uh, but what is your assessment over what was the grand idea and the grand plan uh, after the Second World War when this whole sort of Bretton Woods kind of assist, system emerged. Uh, what did it aim to emerge uh, in your opinion and what did it actually emerge? Uh, what did it actually achieve by the end of it uh, and what emerged out of it? If you could sort of, you know, begin uh, with that a bit for us, please. Sure. sure. Okay. Thanks, Jacob. It's always a pleasure. You can rope me into anything. You've got the... Um, Charisma as well as the status to be able to call all of us to, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, to uh, be able to task. So I'm happy to collaborate with you on anything. So let me quickly share with you a very short presentation that I have to uh, put things in perspective. Because I think, quite frankly, to most of the students, I'd like to say, okay, people like Bangash and me, we tend to confuse more than. Uh, clarify. Because basically we are, um, what do you call it, Brahmins, and we have to show that somehow we are very bright, and we give you terms, and we give you nomenclature, and we give you jargon, and we show off. But let me just say, globalization is nothing but our DNA. I mean, if any, any of you have read this book, Sapiens, that I'm, I know Bangladesh has read, many people have read, it's a very important book, and it says makes a very simple point. I think the whole book is just two or three simple points, although it's 600 pages or something. The point is that we were born to globalize. And we have been globalizing from our birth. So I want to say very simple. This is the chart of our ancestors as they left Africa. We came out of the Red Region, Africa, and we went all over the world. That was the first globalization. If you think about it, we spread out. So we globalized, right? We conquered the Neanderthal, we did this, that, etc. I won't go into the deep history, but we globalized. How did we globalize? We are human beings, we are curious, we went out to see the world, we went out on a walkabout, we went out to see the world and we globalized. We conquered the whole world, we got rid of the environment, we got rid of the trees, we got rid of everything and we globalized. So that's globalization for you, right? So that's the first globalization. Then what happened that we scattered, information was scarce, we didn't know where we each were, we lost contact with our families. Although we can tell by the DNA, we're all the same. The second globalization came with empires, like this Roman empire. So there was a natural tendency that Sapiens guy says, Harari, that people wanted to globalize. And how did they seek to globalize? By conquest. And we did that for a long period of time. And there was no doubt about it. Yeah, that happened. Then the third globalization came with the spread of religion. We thought we couldn't conquer people, we conquered them with ideas. So the spread of Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, all the religions, 
we try to unify the world. And yes, that's that's a very important form of globalization too. So I just want to point out there have been waves of globalization. So we keep panicking at every globalization, but there it is. Here is the graph today of uh, the map today of Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it's very much there. So what do we do? We do globalize. We are a globalizing people. And that's that's a simple message that we must all take, right? Here is Christianity, Islam, etc., seeking to globalize, right? But in that is inherent the other problem that all of us also want to conquer each other. So here Islam and Christianity are fighting still crusades. I'm watching uh, Imran's favorite program, uh, Resurrection. Yes, we are, we are still fighting. Hindus want to conquer us, etc., etc. So there it is. So that's part of the story. But then this is history, all of history, whatever Yaqub might say, this is all of history. And this is what Hariri also says, this is all of history, right? All of history is that your great grandfather, my great grandfather, and they're onwards. All the way down to the monkey. We were extremely poor. We were extremely poor. And there's only one event in human life or two events that Hariri says or whatever, everybody. First was the agricultural revolution at 10,000. The second was the industrial revolution. But everything in between is the same thing. You may, Mangesh will tell you all kinds of stories about conquerors and this, that, etc. But all of it is basically this. Hey, we, all of us trying to seek, as Adam Smith said, some food in our belly. We, we wanted a better life. So we went out and did things, but we could never make it. We were always poor. But the population remained low. Then something happened around about 1800. And you can see the thing, uh, 10,000 is marked by the vertical line. But even then, nothing much happens. Something little bit population starts increasing. You know, same, by the way, the same chart applies to economic growth too. It's the same thing, whether it's population, whether it's growth, whatever. Your population starts increasing and around about 1800, we start getting the technological revolution, the industrial revolution. Thereafter, we achieve all this stuff that we have. Now think about it. That's the only thing that happened in human history. So what is human history? Human history is all one discovery of technology. Forget the kings, forget the conquerors. It's all technology. So from the printing press on, you can see all these technologies listed there. And everything happens around about 1800. Before 1800, the strongest thing, the most energy we had was a horse. So after that, we discovered steam and everything. And the other side of human history is energy. Okay, fine, so it's simple. So here it is again, we see human history, how we develop, what happened. That's all. Now, all of it is globalization. All of it is discovery, 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 discovery of the world, discovery of technology. Part of technology is discovering communication. We couldn't communicate with each other other than with smoke signals, other than with birds, other than with this, that, etc. Now we can communicate instantly that we can sit here and talk together, hundreds of us. We've done, some people have done Zoom meetings with thousands and it works very well. But imagine our ancestors, imagine even the great Akbar, imagine even the great, um, you know, whatever, um, Nicholas II of Russia, or some great emperor of Vienna, or whatever. Those guys had to send pigeons. Those guys had to send messengers. Today, you and I are the kings of communication. So what happened? This is where the rub is. You got communication, you looked at different ways. This is the, the rub is. This is what everybody's talking about. All the thinkers are telling you, man. Very simple. The whole world has evolved again on the first side, exploration. On the second side, discovery of technology. On the third side, we have to figure out how to live with each other because we create value when we interact. We don't create value on our own. On our own, each one of us is useless. We can't even survive a day in the jungle. We can't survive a day alone. Even in the city, we can't survive a day alone. We have to work together. But how do we work together? One is the communist method where you pull, or the military method where you put each other to work and kill each other. The other is to evolve markets. The whole of human history is to discover how to live together, how to evolve markets, how to discover a way to make each other better. Capitalism's uh, real advantage was that it discovered markets and developed markets. But the markets first were local and they had, you know, uh, they had to develop practices and norms and the whole of history is full of how they evolved. Wow. Built how they were this practice, that practice. Local. Then you had people like Napoleon come and try and make a bigger market, conquer, conquer, and try and give their laws. This is what Britain did to us. We were sitting there with some local law. Britain, Brits came and conquered us, gave us company law, gave us penal code, gave us this, gave us that, and now we are working. So at first, people had to conquer each other to make territory, 
to make a big market and give each other the same rules so that we could trade. Now, we have come to a different point, but the most important thing is before you could only trade by means of goods with each other, barter trade. Then we discovered gold. So I would trade with you and take gold. gold. So everybody had to take gold back and forth, etc. Until eventually we discovered money. And money had to evolved all the way from prehistoric times. The real evolution of money took place somewhere in the 19th century. When we accept, so in the 20th century, sorry, in 2017, when the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, et cetera, starting issuing currency, when um, private currencies kind of failed, that's when, so it took, it really, the money, the modern money that you had used evolved around the early 20th century. So there you go, we have the ingredients of a market, we have the ingredients of laws, we have the ingredients of trading practices, and we have developed money and we have developed communications. And it's a whole story of how Columbus went around the world, etc. So many things in between, but we are now here in the 20th century. And then we tested each other out. As Manga will tell you better, we had two world wars to test out territorial claims and we lost. And around about 1919, the American empire decided that it was time to put paid to the last um, empire, which is England and uh, you know, France, etc. And they set the, motion, uh, the process in motion. After the Second World War, they gave them the ultimatum and said, guys, dismantle your empire. So they dismantled the empire because now America was the overlord and the Brits being, had been rendered to a poodle. So they got rid of the empire. They got rid of the empire, but they still we needed a global trading system. That's where the Bretton Woods, et cetera, come in. Now, some people say Keynes, but I think Dexter White, well, White, I think White, Dex, Dexter White was the guy's name. He was probably the bigger genius because he developed the Bretton Woods system. But then there was the UN system too. And what the Americans discovered that the best thing to do was to rule the world through conventions rather than through arms. And that's the era we are in, that's the era of globalization everybody's talking about. It's the era of conventions, it's the era of global law, it's the era of global practices, it's the era of global uh, rules. Unfortunately, this is the timeline of economic governance that you had Bretton Woods Institution come in 1944, Bretton Woods uh, uh, World Bank and the IMF, but then the UN agencies came up at about the same time and they started multiplying and now we've got a ton of UN agencies, but then other entrepreneurs got into the game and we've got other international agencies now that really not in the same level, but they do perform a function. For example, a country, um, an agency like UNESCO, agency like ILO, agency like, which are peripheral agencies, they don't matter much, but they do matter in terms of certain, fixing certain rules. So we are living in the era of global, era of global rules. Multilateralism is at work now. Nationalism has taken root, took root in Europe. We didn't even know what nationalism was, but now we become nationalistic. As Javed Jabbar rightly said to an Indian convention or something, India was never a national state. But today you and I don't even question the nation of, nation of India because every Indian feels they're a nation state. But India itself is discovering that they may be an ideological state. So nationalism is a recent thing in Africa. Africans still don't understand nationalism. Their boundaries are also drawn all over the place. But the key thing is multilateralism reigns supreme now. There are so many things that check our freedom now. If you recall, um, Keynes wrote in his famous whatever, uh, I think in his, uh, whatever, somewhere in the 1920s. And in fact, all the way to the 1950s, 40s, 50s, nobody required a passport to travel anywhere in the world. You didn't require to migrate. You could, you could just go and set up shop anywhere and you could go. Today, without a passport, I can't move anywhere. There's no way I can go settle anywhere. It's all over. No area of the world is available. The last free areas of the world that were available were, the, were the, what is now the US, South America, Australia, which has been taken. So you and I now have no escape. We have to be some passport holders. We can't be free. That's a fact. Now, multilateral agencies have come in because of climate control, human rights, finance, etc. They have a whole set of laws. These laws are multiplying every day, like FATF. FATF is new. And the problem with the poor countries is they neither have the capacity nor the intelligence to keep up with the laws or the rules. So they keep signing and acquiescing to whatever's happening. And then they keep crying, oh, globalization is bad, globalization is bad, do something with us. But at the same time, they want to play national policy. 
which they really don't have. Or if they have, it has to be very, very cerebral. It has to be very well thought out. Now, aid and national policy, unfortunately, the other side that they started was aid. They started aid. I've never understood, and quite frankly, I'm still trying to make up my mind, what is the role of aid? There is aid there to um, give us help, or is aid as a part of global, global, um, global management tool? And I think aid is a part of a global management tool. This is how they manage us. It's not about giving us money. But then the poor countries feel that A, that they must beg for money. So they are willing to do anything to beg for money. They don't understand the rules. They're always being, uh, signing up on the rules. And then they kind of look lost. What happened to us? And then they start criticizing globalization. And then you've got people like Stiglitz and Bhagwati, et cetera, trying to sing as if there's something called, there's an alternative. Mr. Stiglitz, there is no alternative. We are globalized. Mr. Stiglitz, there is nothing you can do to roll back communication. There's nothing you can do, right? And the point is that the US is not going to give up control of the global empire. We have to live within it. We have to figure out the rules. We have to play the game. That means we have to develop our own governance. We have to soften our empty nationalism, our empty nationalism where we think we are very great, we are very strong, we are equal, we are not equal. We are not invited to the G7, we are not invited to the G20, let's face it, we are not equals, right? But we, we are made to feel equals because they'll call us now and again and give us a state banquet. So let's forget thinking we are equals, like Taiwan, Taiwan understands they're not equal of China, they are willing to play the game. We have to learn to play the game, but the game is a cerebral one. The game is something, for example, the Indus Waters Treaty, we must understand it, we must work it. For example, the international, the FATF, we must understand it, we must work it. For example, the Bretton Woods institutions, we must understand, we must work them. If we cannot do our own homework, if we cannot put our nationalism in context, globalization ain't going nowhere, no matter what Stiglitz writes, no matter what Bhagwati writes or Danny Roderick writes, it's going to stay there. The rules are not going to be changed in our favor. We have to figure out how to play the game so that we can be a part of the rule setting agenda, but we have to play it very carefully, very craftily. It requires a lot of thought and attention, which unfortunately we are not willing to give it. We are just there talking about globalization, the abstract as if it's something new. It's just happened and that we are being forced to do something we shouldn't be doing. I think that's all crap. Globalization has always been there. It will always be there. Technology is uncovered it's such that we cannot let anything. Capital controls won't be able to work. Nothing will work. We have to surrender. In the old days, you could keep your exchange rate fixed where you like. Today, you can't. Exchange rate has to be market determined. You have to play the market game. And unfortunately, that's where we are. So I'm happy to answer your questions. This is my rough starting point, uh, Yaku. unmute myself. Uh, so thank you very, very much for this. I think it's been a very good sort of broad in, introduction and uh, you have uh, pointed out a number of um, important things that, that I will now, now pick up on. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to ask you is that um, how far do you, do you think the current sort of post of the global economy has uh, created more inequality? How do you see in inequality kind of playing in it? Because a lot of people claim that, oh, for the way global finance and capital work, uh, there will be less inequality, or that the increasing gap between uh, the rich and the poor is because of this uh, global uh, uh, financial, reg uh, financial regime. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to this whole in inequality debate, and how does sort of economics and finance uh, fit into this? You want me to answer that or get some more questions? I'm happy to answer it. Look, inequality, inequality is God given. I think people complain too much about inequality. Yakub, I'm a terrible tennis player. Would you like me to get the Wimbledon trophy? No. no. Right? Would you like me to get the same money? Roger Federer makes $100 million from tennis. Would you like me to even get a million dollars from tennis? I don't think so, right? Inequality is natural and it exists. To a certain extent, we can fight it. This uh, socialist dream that we can create the world, everybody according to his ability and every day thing, everybody getting according to his needs. I think this is kind of passe and gone. What we want is equality of opportunity. 
we don't want equality of outcomes outcomes are determined by the field how i play tennis that's important but we want equality of opportunity globalization is killing no opportunity in fact it's providing opportunity the best thing that happened to our poor was globalization because they migrated the previous era when they couldn't migrate they were sitting there in absolute poverty the people who migrated to us uk you see them yakub i see them look at them they're emancipated some of them penniless have made millions of dollars no matter who everybody's done well so people have benefited from globalization the poor have benefited from globalization now yes i think most important of all the questions for them it's a national policy that is destroying opportunity not globalization right globalization gives us opportunities china has taken advantage of globalization huge advantage of globalization everybody knows that south korea has taken huge advantage of globalization globalization was there for us to take advantage of we didn't take it because we were too busy making sugar we were too busy making cars they didn't tell us to make sugar and cars they told us come and compete like china we didn't want to compete we said fine we are happy making sugar and cars sitting in synth club it's wonderful to sit in synth clubs and your factory is making sugar and cars and you got a subsidy my god what a great life it's wonderful you and i have friends who go to do that right they love their mercedes and they're doing very well they wear fancy suits that's not globalization that's bloody i hate to use another word that's bloody national nationalism right nationalism problem identify the problem it's not globalization it is our stupid tax and documentation policy that is stopping us from working it is our stupid policy that are stopping me from investing you from investing doing anything it is our stupid policy that has created these universities where kids don't get a good education right globalization offers us a good education people like you go abroad you come back with a phd you doing well right so come on think about it don't blame globalization for inequality it's the national policy that is the problem and these jokers these academics who are writing against this thing are stupid yes where globalization cuts i'll tell you rick or dick for example well we come to the uh, yeah fair enough go ahead sure go ahead no 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 so well well will we come back to the national thing uh, in a in a in a minute because after a, a while i wanted to focus on on pakistan here in the second bit uh, but let me just 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 continue the the uh, you know some points from your from your uh, op- opening remarks uh the second thing that you were really talking about was um aid uh and you kind of mentioned that you have you know you are unsure what purpose does that does global aid kind of kind of serve so could you kind of talk talk a bit more about it that you know how do kind of rich countries give this kind of aid or how international financial institu- institutions uh give these kinds of aids like you know the imf gives these uh, stabilization packages uh, uh throughout the world to uh, dozens of countries and of course in pakistan we are we are very used to it now uh what role does that pay, uh, play in uh one the global market but also in terms of how it kind of um, you know um, uh, creates um, a synergy between or a, or a link uh, between the ifis and national governments and what does that that do to the national governments and their own economy look i think uh, first of all we must remember that uh, again going back in history the, when these guys came to conquer the world they used trade as a way or in this trade as well as debt as a way of getting their way for example in in china the opium trade was very important and they conquered china they really didn't conquer china but kind of conquered china in the sense made them subservient by both selling opium as well as guns but india they took over again from economic vantage point egypt they came in and directly controlled egypt when they gave egypt some debt to build the suez canal egypt egypt couldn't retain return the debt and you remember what happened the bankers physically came and took over egypt right so given that what happened was that as, like all things there are unintended consequences when keynes and uh, this guy and uh, white when they developed the bretton woods institutions let's now study the bretton woods institutions for a minute they the, the whole idea was that look you had egypt you didn't want to have, let that happen again you had germany you might you will recall and i hope your students have read this that keynes when he was a young guy 25 26 he went to the treaty of uh, versailles in and as a junior official and he wrote this famous book called the economic consequences of peace 
which is a wonderful book. If your kids have not read it, they should read it. Very racy, great prose, but uh, very, makes very valid points and, uh, you know, very critical of everybody, including calling Clemenceau an old, you know, whatever um, uh, guy and calling Wilson names and things. But the key thing that he said was that you, in 22, he predicted that you have put, put Germany on the path of poverty, that it will return to war. And yes, Germany returned to war. Right? In between, Germany had hyperinflation and there was nobody to help Germany. So Keynes and Dexter White, they were kind of far seen and they said, look, we must create. Keynes wanted to create. And I think there's a bit of a tension there. Keynes really wanted to create a global reserve insurance agency, which was the IMF, that we would kind of come to each other's help through a global reserve pooling arrangement that everybody will keep their gold together. And that if a country needed help, we'll come to help the country, right? So it was like an insurance agency, right? US was fresh off the uh, thing. And last week we did the seminar with uh, uh, Marcus uh, Dachel. You met the guy, you know the guy. And he did, chronicled it very well that these guys, basically what they were saying was that we would develop the, first they started out developing Europe after the uh, Second World War. The Marshall Plan came in. Then they kind of reluctantly extended to the third world. The idea was the World Bank was that it would supply short-term aid, develop these countries, and it would all be over. So technically speaking, IMF is supposed to be a permanent body. The World Bank, UNICEF, and all these agencies are supposed to die away after a while. Aid was supposed to stop in 4050. Aid was not even supposed to be at 4050. Year. Aid was supposed to be like Marshall Plan, I think finished in 10 years. Aid was supposed to finish in 10 years. But as things happen, bureaucracies settle in and those bureaucracies can't be killed. So you've got these huge bureaucracies sitting and then the bureaucracies have a mission creep. So the bureaucracies started developing. And if you recall, Mar Marcus Dershel points out he, that the US didn't even want to set up aid. Through the Eisenhower years, they didn't want to set up aid. It was finally the Kennedy years that they set up aid, right? And they learned UK, et cetera, came much later to aid. What happened is that these guys discovered over time that it's a great way to sell their own vision. And then came the Cold War. So they wanted to sell their own vision of anti-communism to these countries. So the Colombo plan, et cetera, happened to sell us those visions. And we keep buying, we kept buying them. Now they find it's a great policy too. And the IMF has also developed kind of an overreach and a mission creep. In fact, there was a study in, um, I think 1980 something, seven or eight or something, by this famous uh, couple of economists who came to the hired specially by the fund. One was Paul Collier, the second one was, I forget those guys' name. They actually said, wrote that down, there's a congressional study, in fact, not an IMF study, congressional study. And they said that the IMF should not lend to poor countries below 6,000 per capita income because this is a much deeper structural problem of a growth issue. IMF is only there for a short-term issue. Now, the problem is IMF wants, obviously wants power. It wants to grab, so it has grabbed. The World Bank also wants power. It keeps saying, World Bank has set itself a mission which will never end in life. World Bank's mission is end poverty. And poverty cannot end. By definition, poverty cannot end. That's like saying, hey, make Nadeem a Wimbledon. Everybody must be a Wimbledon player. That's, they, nobody's, everybody's not going to be a Wimbledon player. Poor people are going to be there in the world forever. And then the World Bank keeps changing the definition of poverty. So there always will be poor. So obviously the World Bank is not going anywhere. Then the bilateral agencies, thanks to Bono, etc., you know, people, a bloody singer coming into, I think it's probably hired to do it or whatever. The UK agencies come in and now aid has become a foreign policy tool. It is not going to help any country. In fact, there's a, a lovely woman, I'm trying to get her for a webinar, Dambisi Moyo, I don't know whether you've read her book or not. She wrote a book on aid, an African woman, Goldman Sachs, etc. very good woman. She's written this book, I forget the name, but her central point was, there's a book on Africa, and quite a few books have been written, that aid it has its own constituency. The, the governments of the world now, like our government, our government is beholden to aid, not to you and I. So the citizens are disenfranchised and the aid agencies become the, um, the, the kind of uh, people who the governments answer to. Case in point, our government right now is preparing a COVID plan 
And UNDP and the World Bank are planning, uh, preparing it for them. And despite my intervention many times, they said, no, UNDP World Bank must prepare it because we really need to answer to them. We don't need to answer to our people. So that's the kind of situation we've got now. And I think people should study aid and people should study what's happening. But our government has given up its own governance. It is beholden to the donors. It is letting them do all policy. And that, in a sense, suits everybody in the international world. So what do you think? So, of course, there is, there is another line of argument uh, that people say that because of this aid trap, and a lot of people do call it, a, call it a trap. It's these IFIs that are kind of controlling policy in the world. And it's these IFIs that more than the militaries, perhaps, uh, that are kind of running the world like, like, like these big, big corporations. And, you know, um, in the recession uh, a decade or so ago, uh, you know, the US government, even though, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people claim it shouldn't have, but actually went and put out all these uh, big corporations that had actually caused the recession and caused the whole uh, whole slump to begin with. So do you really think that this internationalization and this financial capital in the way uh, it's spread throughout the world through these corporations and these IFIs, they are the actual kind of by the end of it uh, controlling factor in the world at the moment? No, I wouldn't say they're the controlling factor because look, China has done it. South Korea has done it. Malaysia has done it. There are countries that are winning. It's all a question, Yakub of putting your muscle into it. And the muscle I mean is this one, the brain muscle. That's the only muscle that we don't work with, right? That's a problem. If only we used our brain, we found the strategies. We... Now it's a very difficult environment. You have to navigate the jungle of international laws. You have to navigate the jungle of aid. You have to navigate the jungle of treaties. You have to navigate the jungle of all kinds of non-tariff barriers, goods rules, etc. all kinds of things to be able to function in this world. If you can operate that flexible at that, at that cerebral level, the opportunities are there for you. The second thing that's very important in this world is this is the world of technical change and innovation. If you can innovate, you're fine. Take Alibaba, take Bedu, take you know Facebook, whatever these things are happening. Now, in our part of the world too, take Daraz, take Zameen.com, these guys are doing it, right? The question really is the world is wide open for us despite all these things. If our government wants to get its act together and really put its muscle, the brain muscle into work, yeah, we can, we, can, we can develop a strategy. I'm not saying we don't have to fight. We have to develop a strategy how to navigate the wilderness. It's a wilderness. We have to navigate our strategy. Our firms, the same thing. Our universities, the same thing. We can actually work our way. Chinese universities have done very well. Look at Chinese universities. 20 years ago, they were in the same place as us. So there are things that we can do it really requires we as a society to begin to understand the global rather than sitting there criticizing it, understand it, begin to work with it, find our own way through it. And there's tons of things that we can do, but the reform must happen at home. This is what I wrote in my book too. Unless you develop your state, we can keep talking about this, that, etc. Unless we develop our markets, unless we develop our universities, we are going nowhere. The reform lies at home. If you can't do the reform at home, it's no use living the world. Mm. Good, true. Uh, before we come and talk a bit more about Pakistan, um, how far do you do you think that uh, the world's economy or uh, the way capital kind of functions in the world is going to change after you know the well now the coming in of the coronavirus crisis? Like we don't know when it'll act actually end. or in any significant way alter the way economic relations uh, like Pakistan, for example, have, have uh, spent billions of dollars, uh, you know, in uh, giving money directly to the poor. So that, of course, has uh, created a huge, a huge, a huge deficit, um, uh, which, which they don't have money to cover. So how far do you, do you think the coronavirus crisis is going to kind of resettle uh, 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 economic relations in the world? Jakub, the simple answer is, what is that famous French statement? You probably remember it uh, well. I don't. Blue sa change. What is that? Um, Ma'am, such uh, something like that. You know the famous statement, the more things remain the same, the more things change. The oh, more the more things change, the more they remain the same. Yeah. I think it's that. Humanity is not going to change because of the coronavirus. We've had many viruses from plagues to whatever. Everything has happened in the world. We are not going to change. You can already see the markets opening up everywhere. Right? Yes, the plague is here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We will live through it. We will. Everything will happen. Things will happen. 
even today, even yesterday, whatever, finance has never been an issue. Finance is an issue that has been sold to us. It is only the issue of little minds. Finance has never been an issue in the world. Case in point, very simple, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, was finance an issue for them? Was finance an issue for Jack Ma? Finance is never an issue. Finance, as Raghuram Rojan, uh, Rajan wrote this book and a couple of papers on this, which is very important. The purpose of finance is very interesting. I think very interesting argument that he makes and many other people, in fact, even uh, Friedman made that earlier. Very important point. What is the role of finance? People forget. Role of finance is not to make businesses. The role of finance is to chase ideas. If you have the ideas, money will come to you. But if you don't have the ideas and you've got a begging bowl, then of course we'll get the crumbs and we'll get them badly. If you have good ideas, if you have a Google, if you have a Facebook, if you have an Alibaba, if you have something, if you have something to sell the world, money will come to you. So the issue is not finance and nothing will change. Yes, we, I'm, I'm sitting in my house for uh, six weeks, seven weeks. I'll probably sit here for another six weeks, seven weeks. After that, I'll get tired. I'll come out. All of us will start coming out. We'll do this. Some of us will die. We'll take the risk. Yes, the risk has to be taken. But we take risks all the time, Yaku. I mean, when we travel, we take a risk. When you travel in your car, you take a risk, etc., etc. Everything happens. We take a risk all the time. So things will change for a while. But after that, we come back to business. People have to do business. People have to make things work. We will do business. And when we start doing business, Yakub, then what matters is your brain. And if Pakistan does not have a brain, I am sorry, don't blame others. We have to develop our own brain. Don't tell me, I mean, people then tell me, oh, you're pessimistic. You're just, Yakub, you're uh, ko bulalo, huh? I don't know. Yakub, Maksud, sorry, I had to do this. So the, the key thing is, if we can't think, people tell me Pakistan is a very talented individual. It doesn't matter. As a country, can we think? As a country, can we develop new ideas? If we can't, then we can keep blaming the world. We'll have 10,000 seminars. Oh, the world doesn't give us an opportunity. The world is so mean to us. The world doesn't give us enough money. Bullshit. There's money available. How much money do you want? But give me an idea. If you can't give me an idea, there's no money. Sorry. True. Now, coming more since since uh, uh, since I did want to want to talk about Pakistan, Pakistan um, you have of course. Uh, uh, written about this too, but how do you see since its inception, Pakistan's kind of interaction with uh, the world economy? Uh, you know, there was a there was a time Pakistan did reasonably well um, in terms of its economy, but then it's had such slumps that you know it's had to had to go back to the IMF. I think by eight or nine times by by now. Um, what do you what do you think are the pitfalls that Pakistan has always had in terms of? Uh, not being able to rec recognize the right way of uh, kind of fixing its economy and and, and becoming more of a, a gainer uh, from the world of finance and uh, the global economy. First, this myth that Pakistan was a big winner in a Yub's time or whatever. I'll tell you a little story about this very simple. When we went abroad to study, that was a time when Pakistan was very closed, etc. And, you know, many of us went abroad to study. And many of us thought we were so doing so well in Pakistan, first division, this, that, etc. In the first week, we found out that yeah, we were at the bottom of the barrel, bottom of the class, because everybody was so much better than us. Pakistan was doing so well in those days because there was no competition, my friend. The world was not emancipated. We were the first country to be emancipated. India wanted, India chose a different strategy. They wanted to follow a nationalistic strategy. We wanted to be in the arms of the US and we wanted to be in the arms of the rest of the world. So we did well. And the, so can you also, sorry. All the infrastructure went to India. We started zero infrastructure. So yes, on zero, anything looks good when it grows. So in the first few years, we grew at six, seven, eight percent. Everybody thought, oh my God, this is wonderful, wonderful. But remember we had, we didn't even have a bloody energy center, you know, distribution system here. We had no industry, nothing. So, okay, fair enough, we grew. But quite frankly, as soon as the African countries, other countries came in, especially these stations, we were nowhere on the scene. We couldn't even stand in the field. And my famous example of this Bholu brothers. Bholu was a pahlwan, Rustam e Zaman, until he faced the world. <laughs> he was nothing, remember? Bholu brother, Bholu was the champion of the world, Rustam e Zaman. And then he was nothing. So, look, that's not the point. We have never really tried, we've always tried this point boy approach. 
give me something, give me something, give me some whatever preferential trade agreement, give me some finance, give me this. We never want to fight the battle on our own. Let me play with Roger Federer, but please make me the champion. That is will not work. We have to figure out our own strategy. We have to do something. We don't want to do that. So nothing has changed. We have to change. The world wants us to change and we have to change. We have to stop these playing these stupid, stupid games, whether we have a little, this, this, what Lee Kuan Yew called, I don't know whether you know this or not, you probably do. Lee Kuan Yew came here and somebody asked him about Pakistan, he said, your democracy, because they said you are not democracy, etc. He said, your democracy is an auction of non-existent resources, right? We just want to fight over our little two cents worth. We want to fight over our GORs, our government houses, our premier president houses, our protocol, etc. So the world doesn't care whether you have protocol or not. Even Boris Johnson is roaming around outside talking to people, right? So for God's sakes, we have to grow up in this world. It's, a, it's, it's got nothing to do with the rest of the world. We never went to a party. We were always what we are. We were always growing sugar. We were always making stupid things. We are not trying to compete in the world. And I'm, I, forgive me, it hasn't started even today. Gee. What, what, but, but, what do you think has kept us away from that? Is it, is it really this fascination with like protocols and you know, plots and perks and everything? What is it that's really, you know, sem nearly 75 years since our inception, we haven't been able to break this and move out and actually think, you know, why, why, why is it that, that you know, as you, again, you very rightly pointed out that, uh, you know, all these universities, you know, that have been set up for a long time, haven't really done that well. So what, what, what do you think, if you had to identify a couple of things, uh, what do you think are the main issues that have really kind of uh, thwarted our, our real development? Very simple. Where are we thinking? Who's thinking? You tell me in our 70 years history, you know, that you done a lot of work on Pakistani history, you've not done even the history of the judicial system of Pakistan, etc., etc. Please tell me, where, where has thinking happened in Pakistan through our history? That's why I was interested in reading Dashiell's book. He, Dashiell recounts, and I know I knew this, but I wanted ratification. From the very beginning, we started relying on aid consultants. <laughs> Nehru, Nehru didn't. Nehru decided that he wanted his own people to make a plan. Nehru decided very early on, if you recall, Nehru decided he wanted to build world-class universities. He left his own universities by the side and said, let's build the IIs, IIMs. And those things today are standing them in very good stead, right? India has a large number of bad universities like ours too, but they have about 10 of them that are world-class, even better than MIT, IIT, et cetera, right? That was a difference of strategy. There is some thought in India. We have never had any thought in Pakistan. We have been very good at, I had a seminar today, webinar two or a webinar today. The title of it was, why is Pakistan talent repellent? We are the only country that throughout its Nobel prize winner. We are the only country that throughout anybody who had any talent, Anybody. It's not that we don't produce good people. We produce lovely people. You've seen many of them are professors overseas. Many of them are leading doctors, etc. Leading, you know, people. But we throw them out of the country. So my answer to you is very simple. If the country does not start thinking, if we don't value thinking, if the government, I've asked the government many times, why don't we ask our universities to do something? Okay, they'll fail three times, four times, maybe they'll, they'll produce something. But we don't want to do that. So as a society, we have shunned thinking. We have shunned research. COVID has come in. You can see what's happening. Right now, they don't have any technical people doing their work for them. Mm. Why don't we have technical people doing the work? We have, a, we have a kind of a fear of technocracy. We always say technocrats are bad. Technocrats are bad. I don't see why. How can you run a government without technocrats? I don't know. How can you run any system without technocrats? But we actually have politicized everything to the core. We have politicized education. We politicized energy. We politicized everything, even railway. Everything in England, you've been in England, I've been in England. Is the railway a political entity? Here, everything is a political entity. So we have to really begin to do a homework at home, beginning with thinking through our systems, beginning with separating politics from certain things. Politics is not in everything. And but mind you, if you look at what Sweden is doing, that's the most important message Sweden is giving right now. 
that they are letting the technocrats manage corona, not the politicians. That's a very important message that has come out of Sweden. Go ahead. True. Uh, also want to, and, and, and uh, after this, we will take some questions from students. Uh, but I wanted to ask um, if you could also call. Oops, I lost him. Kya hua ji, I lost. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think I'm back. Oh, sorry, Bangladesh, yeah. I think I'm back. So what I wanted to ask about was, uh, you know, since you've been recently talking about this, the whole idea of getting these 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 consultants, you know, and how concerns that people have, and you know, uh, especially from the left, you you will hear this all the time that it's actually that these consultants that the ground. Sorry, I could, I could by the IMF, by the UND. Look, Bangash, the consultants, consultants will always be there. This is the hiring these international consultants. Uh, the IMF, World Bank, and everything. And I think these are the other, other. I think you know. Uh, uh, well, uh, there is an argument that a lot of people say that these are the ones who perpetuate economic policies around the world, and because they come from IFIs. Uh, is it's in their interest to perpetuate bad economic policy that is actually not very relevant to the ground realities. Uh, what would you say, say to that? My point is, Mangesh, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. It's got nothing to do with international consultants. Nature abhors a vacuum. We need ideas to run a society. They have to come from somewhere. If we are not generating them, and if our people are not engaged in a debate, they have to come from somewhere. And if our um, the protocol people, the people who are sitting out there, making our policies behind protocol and behind closed doors, I mean, our prime minister, no matter who he is, he never sees any one of us. He does, never even talks to us. How does he know what's happening? He talks to five people, he makes policy, right? So the question is, that vacuum has to be filled up by somehow. Somehow, that vacuum is then obviously going to be filled up by IFIs and international agencies because there is also a color complex here. The white man looks superior to us. But then there's another dynamic that's taken over, Bangladesh. I mean, think about it. You might think Cambridge is a great place, Harvard is a great place, Chicago is a great place, but they've all fallen into the game now because it's a matter of funding. Everybody wants funding. So what's happening? They, they've realized that these aid funds are coming in. So LSE, Cambridge, Oxford, etc., have carved into those funds. They've got this project now called International Growth Center. That's just one of the projects. They've also got a failed states project. Universities had that. Harvard, to begin with, had the advisor, Harvard, Harvard advisory group that made a, um, a, a policy for the first 10 years of our life, right? Mm -hmm. So the universities have realized it's a great way to make money. So what, they, what do they do? They have surplus labor. They have the you know, weak professor. The best professors will never come here. By the way, only one place did the best professors in the world go. That was Latin America, Harburger and Friedman. And yes, the legacy of that, we can talk about that. Right? In Pakistan, Papa Naik came, who wasn't one of the best guys. The big guys never came to Samuel said so those guys never came to Pakistan, right? They sent their dregs here. But then at the same time, Harvard started the School of Public Policy for us, right? And the School of Public Policy came, was given only to our bureaucrats and they came back with a Harvard degree. They were never one of the best. And then Cambridge Center got into the act. Some of our people went to get their degrees there. They really didn't deserve the degrees. They really had, they have a two-track system out there. They send people back with a third-rate degree. And, you know, um, those people, they say, we have to train the natives. It's the old Macaulay thing. Train the natives. Don't worry about it. Let's, let's just make them some good Englishmen. Now, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. It's just that nature abhors a vacuum. Things have to happen when you don't have your own mind, when you don't have your own thought. For example, uh, just give the bureaucrat a little trip. I want to sell a project. All I have to do is tell the secretary, hey, I'm going to send you for a trip to Washington and you know to San Francisco, and you can go and do this. So he'll do anything for me. 
But that's because there's a vacuum. We haven't created our own thinking. We haven't created our own systems. So yes, those things will happen. You know, entrepreneurs all over the world, the entrepreneurs have to do things. So I don't think we should go about blaming the world. The problem is ours, but we must understand the problem. Yeah, there is a huge system out there that we have to fight now. It's not a question of that you and I. So I mean, quite frankly, I'm like Don Quixote fighting those guys. You can't fight them. Unless our government wakes up, unless all of us wake up, unless our university wakes, wake up, we develop a strategy on how to carve out a space for ourselves, not about fighting anybody, carving out something for ourselves. How do we run our energy system? How do we run our political system? For example, we had this webinar day before yesterday on um, our constitution. I mean, I think you guys should think about it. What is our constitution? What, should, what kind of an election system should we have? That should be a subject of some discussion in our universities, but our universities don't do that. So we have to think about it. There are lots of space for us to do things, but we have to think about it ourselves. Go ahead. Uh, a couple of questions from the students. Um, Fahad, are you there? Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm in. Fahad? Go ahead, you go. Ah, please ask your question. Sir, my question is, uh, the Pakistan's balance of payment process has led us to grow in spurts instead of maintaining a sustained per capita growth. Whenever there is a high growth, uh, we get a balance of payment problem and eventually end up going to the IMF again and again. So is there, is, is there any way that we can say that, yes, now we, we have got away and we will never go to the IMF ever again? Yeah. Um, in, in 2011, I made this thing called the Framework of Economic Growth, which is still lying on the PAD website. And I stand by it. Hey, look, the only way out of the IMF is if we grow. And what does growth mean? It's very simple. We can work it out. Pakistan has about 60 million youth, right? Pakistan has about 50 million youth under the age of 20, I think, maybe, no, maybe more. Sorry, 50% of our population, 60% of the population is under the age of 30, right? So that's about 120 million people um, under the age of 30. These people will need jobs. In order to give them jobs, we have to grow at 8% per annum. And in order to not get into balance of payments problem, we have to grow very rapidly and we have to allow our exports to expand, expand very rapidly. And other things. How do we make that happen? It, to my mind, we can do a deep analysis, but the simplest analysis is get investment going. How do we get investment going? Let us let any one of you kids do anything. If you want to go out and set a chabriwala out there, if you want to set up a massage parlor out there, if you want to go out and run around for 10 miles and make money, do it. We must enable you to do something and make money. How can that be done? By deregulating, deregulating, deregulating. Ever since this country has been born, we haven't deregulated anything. We've re-regulated, re-regulated. We have put on so much regulation that you can't breathe. They have dismantled all the kokas in the world. What is wrong with kokas? Kokas create employment. New York has 50,000 kokas. Singapore has 100,000 kokas. London has 75,000 kokas. Why can't we have kokas in this country? Because the bureaucracy doesn't like them. Because the bureaucracy why, wants to run around in protocol cars, right? So we have to think through these things. Employment is created everywhere, everywhere, no matter what you do. When you think about it, when I was growing up, we couldn't have a telephone other than a government telephone. Today, look at the number of telephones you guys are carrying and how it has created employment. Schools, when I was growing up, there were only two schools in Lahore. Now, or maybe four or five. But now, because of private schools, look at the employment that has come up. Yes, we create fresh problems when things happen, but we have to allow things to happen. So I think it's a simple thing. We have to just change our mind. Right now, we don't want growth. We only want balance of payments, clarity, and we want no growth. Our bureaucrats refuse to have growth. They refuse to allow things to happen, which is why they're killing kokas, they're killing construction. They don't want buildings to be made. They only want sugar mills and textile mills. The world doesn't want sugar mills and textile mills, okay? The world doesn't want that. You may want that. You may feel good about that. That doesn't happen. We have to do what the world wants. There, I don't, I, I think we have to just allow that to happen. And if we do, we can grow much faster, get out of the balance payment problem within five years. G, anybody else? Ji, uh, Nazir had a had a question. Uh, sorry, uh, you can please confirm my voice is clear. Yeah. Uh, sir, the discussion that we have had until now 
is uh, that revolves around the uh, evolution of globalization. That's a natural phenomena that we cannot resist. Uh, and the inequality that comes with it is justified on the basis that globalization is creating more opportunities than uh, equal uh, outcomes. But the question can be beyond that, like beyond the nation state, that uh, there are some concerns that are neither concern of a nation state or uh, the transnational corporations that are leading the uh, globalization, economic globalization, uh, like environmental hazard. Uh, Coming with actually incorporate the real environmental cost that uh, globalization is incurring. Uh, so, how do you think that this globalization is sustainable or it is going to keep uh, going on with that thing? So please realize globalization is not causing environmental costs, environmental problems. Environmental problem is being caused by a national entities refusing to accept global solutions. We need a global solution to environment. It can't be a national solution. But if we don't believe in global solutions, then it's globalization. So let's not think that globalization is causing the environmental problem. What is causing the environmental problem is our national sovereignty issues. For example, very simple thing. Coronavirus has shown how Lahore has been cleaned up. Today I can breathe. Before the virus, I couldn't breathe. And pretty soon, 10 days time, now that the lockdown is finished, I will start, stop. I will have starting to start having breathing troubles again. It is our car, cars that are causing our pollution, not globalization. I have been after a bureaucracy for the last 10 years. Can we limit cars? They said, no, we can't limit cars. In fact, we want more and better cars. So I said, okay, can we have electric cars? No, we can't have electric cars because our states can't make electric cars. That's not globalization's fault, right? The globalization problem, yes, I agree. That is a problem of American nationalism, Chinese nationalism, etc. that they can't come to an agreement on a global um, um, order. For example, if we want to end the environment problem, we have to limit the use of the car. And there, all of us are at fault. All of us, including us, because we love our cars. We built underpasses, fly over everything for our cars. How many of you kids own a car? Can you tell me? How many of you kids will lots. own a Sorry? Well, lots, obviously. Lots of you have a car. You have a car. You have a car. You have a car. You have a so the point is that lots of people don't have cars, but a few have the right to operate them willfully as they like. That has to end. We still haven't accepted any pollution standards on our fuel. Euro 4, Euro 3 standards, we have not accepted. We haven't got, it, got to Euro 1 yet. Right? So we have to accept those standards. That is the fault of every country. It's not the fault of globalization. Yes, we have a consumer society, and yes, we should have a consumer society. But at the same time, countries are cleaning up their acts, and we have to start accepting the cleaning up of that. The only thing that you can say globalization, that the global agencies haven't been able to form a convention. UN has been trying to form a convention on environment. They can't. That's, but that's a nationalism problem, not globalization problem. G. Right. Any else? Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, uh, as, yeah. as, you, as you spoke that uh, we Pakistanis have a national identity and we keep that very dear to ourselves. Uh, with that national identity, of course, we have some fantasies to take care of, like uh, uh, we are not willing to trade with our uh, neighbor country. That's a big market for us and can be uh, a potential source for our economic growth. But we are not willing to do that. The uh, bureaucracy is not allowing that. Uh, how long we will be able to hold that uh, position and uh, prior, uh, give priority to our national identities more than the gl global uh, force that has been trying to let us to that growth? I think there's nothing wrong with the national identity. We can have a national identity, provided we use it wisely. For example, the Swiss have a very strong national identity. The Nordics have a very strong national identity. The Chinese have a very strong national identity, but they know how to use it. We unfortunately have a very belligerent, very strange national identity. We have a national identity without a national trust or national social capital. 
we don't trust each other we can't work with each other we don't respect each other for example along comes you know bill smith and we say oh bill smith is better than jakub bangish jakub bangish must be you know because he's not white enough he must be younger. today for example in my um, human resource seminar a very bright young woman who heads a, a recruitment agency said to me that i feel that if i go to a government office i should color i should wear a blonde wig i should make put on white foundation i should wear a tinted white uh, blue eyed uh, contact lenses so that i can look white then they listen to me they won't listen to me unless i look white so on the, on the one side we are very aggressively nationalistic on the other side we don't respect our own nationality we don't think that our own people can be as good so that's for the other side but please it's not a question of nationality and on trade with india quite tricky right now i don't want to trade with india with what's happening in modi how can we trade with that guy he is not reasonable if a reasonable government comes in with india we should love to trade with india but that's but trade with india is not the only problem our problem is who are we trading with we are not even trading with afghanistan we are not trading with central asia we are not selling anything to uh, this thing of now iran i was in sri lanka for 3 years bangladesh knows and i called all the pakistani industrialists in the big states said come to sri lanka there's a market waiting to be taken over they would not go to sri lanka bangladesh they won't go to bangladesh they won't go to indonesia so the point is it's also in us we also have to there's a whole world out there it's not just india and these days transport costs don't matter transport costs are zero as you can see amazon doesn't even charge you for shipping a thing so really transport costs don't matter what matters is your ability to come up with ideas and think through things if you can do that yeah we can make it so there's a number of areas where we have to think through we have to think through technology we have to think through the global architecture the global conventions are now very complicated very difficult we have to think through those things we have to develop social capital so that we can work together if you can't work together you can't go anywhere right and we have to develop new products we have to talk about we have to deal with the world and most important of all for example we have to have a culture to deal with the world i mean we are losing so much let me give you something that that kind of rattle you a little i mean for example we want tourism without alcohol which is a joke we are an agricultural country we don't want to export alcohol which is a joke hey guys come on i mean you want to make money or you want to be you know so we have to understand the the the, the, the arabs once told me you know guys we don't mind trading in anything provided so apart from saudi arabia all the arab egyptians for example i was in egypt for a long time egyptian told me all the time hey guys we don't worry we don't want to drink but we'll sell drinks to the tourists if they come in right so they want to preserve their national identity but they also want to preserve their global uh, need and global demand so we have to develop that kind of a thinking we have to be clear about things we are too confused in people and i think we have to get that clarity before we make progress okay great uh nazir you wanted to ask something else also uh yes sir i wanted to ask sir there is the, is there any hope or anything to believe sorry i think we lost nazir you must upgrade your internet yeah how you cut uh, can you repeat that nazir or write it out jakub ha uh, i think we 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 lost nazir okay uh, unless he kind of comes in here no okay doesn't matter if he sends you his question so we are actually a few minutes out of time in any case yeah uh, so we have a few minutes out of time in any case but uh, thank you so much uh, dr nadeem ulhaq for actually coming to us uh, and speaking to us about this important topic and actually giving us lots to think about and i think one of the big takeaways here here is that a lot of course needs to be worked out in the in the in the global uh, realm uh, in terms of how things happen there in terms of how these global financial institutions would use aid how how they use consultancy and how these kinds of frameworks are constructed i think the big takeaway is that the real work has to be done at the national level as long as we don't fix the national level the international level cannot be blamed uh, for everything that is going wrong and i think that's a very important thing that it's it is local as well as global so yes in in the global sphere there there are a lot of issues there are lots of problems but they emanate they kind of Uh, uh permeate through the, the 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 national problems and the national issues and i think those are the ones that 
if they are fixed then perhaps the global market would be a more equal a more profitable and a better place uh, but the work really needs to be done at the local and at the national level and only then things at the global level will actually change so i think that's a very very important takeaway from today's uh, uh, lecture and discussion and thank you very much deep lakh saab for uh, uh, speaking speaking to us today and uh, thank you all who have joined us uh, of course my class but also the people who have, who have been watching us online uh, for this and uh, thank you again pite for giving us these these ideas thank you yakub thank you very much all so, the best for you know, that's another very important thing that happen okay so so thank you very much uh, nadeem saab and speak to you soon all right bye thank you bye bye